uh, we've been learning, we're on Daf Mem Zayin, we're on page 47, and we've been learning the uh, situations where a person does some type of, uh, he eats something that's not so kosher, and the question is, can he do a zimun together with other people? And the, one of the cases was where the person took miser before they took truma. And the scenario was it, was it was done early, meaning it wasn't yet winnowed and made into a pile. It was at an earlier stage. And really, they weren't obligated yet in taking truma or miser. But the person did take miser, and they took miser first. And we concluded that they can do a zimun, that person. In other words, they ate bread made from that produce that the main truma was never taken, but uh, it was given to the Levite, and the Levite did his, his portion of the truma, but he didn't do the original truma. So the kaihen lost out in a, a small percentage that he should have gotten from the original a large amount. He should have gotten that plus what the Levite gives him. And he only got what the Levite gives him. He didn't get the original truma. And so he lost out. And the uh, Gemara tells us that this is actually exempt from the original truma. And therefore, you could do a zimun because, you know, you're exempt. So it comes out that there's really like a loophole here that if you want to get out of giving the original truma, you uh, give the Levite before it's ready. We give it while it's in, in its stalk form before it's uh, winnowed and, and made into piles. And you give him while it's in its stalks and you could get out of giving the original truma. So we mentioned that uh, there is a, one of the commentaries mentions, so are you allowed to do this uh, in the, uh, you know, are you allowed to do this in order to get out of, uh, is this prohibited to do in the first place? Now, you did it already, so we say you can do a zimun because you're allowed to eat it. You don't have to take the truma, the extra truma. But the question is, were you allowed to do this in the first place? And the one of the commentaries mentions clearly that this is prohibited because it's called gezel koyhein. You're actually causing a loss for the koyhein. It's considered stealing from the koyhein, even though the Torah says that in the situation you did it, you are exempt but it's still considered a gezel. It's considered stealing from the kohen. So uh, you're not allowed to do this preferably. Now, this would only work if you did it, if you gave that tevel early, if you gave, if you gave that, those, um, that, the miser, excuse me, gave the miser, the tithing to the Levite early before it's obligated. But if you uh, waited till after it's obligated, you left out the truma and you just gave the Levite his portion, the miser, you actually, would not be exempt, and the Levite would not be exempt from giving the truma. He would have to give both parts of the truma. He have to give his portion of the truma, which is from the from the miser, and he'd have to give the portion that was missed out for originally from whatever he got. So he'd have to give the two percent for the original truma and his ten percent that he gives from his miser. So that is the uh, the Gemara explained that there's two verses. One verse exempts him. One verse obligates him. And um, therefore, the Gemara says the, the difference is if it was, if it became obligated in Truma and Miser before you gave it to the Levi, then it stays with that obligation and you're not exempt, even if you mess up the order. And if you were not yet obligated in the Truma and Miser, so you gave it early before the obligation, that would be an example where after the fact, if you did it that way, then you don't end up giving the koyhein his portion. Now, uh, the source of the obligation was from a pasuk. The pasuk says, you have to take from all of your maestros, from all of your gifts, you should tarimu es kol trumas Hashem. You should take truma, and Rashi brings us in the second line um, of the... Uh, Rashi's in the second line of the Rashi's on 47b, he brings down the Pasuk. He says, as called Trumas Hashem, all of the Trumas of Hashem you have to give. And that implies any potential Truma that it's obligated in, 
you have to separate. That means you would have to separate more than one truma. You'd have to separate your truma and you have to separate the other one that was not, that was not um, removed and separated. You, you will have to separate that. And that is, the, uh, that is the source that after it was obligated, you don't get around, you can't get around this problem. Yes, uh, Ben. Yeah, I, I wonder why, why an owner would do that because the gain that he gains is so minuscule. Minimal. Yeah. And it's only straight taken from the Cohen. Why would you right. rather give it to well, the Levy than the Cohen? Well, what it seems like is it might have been done by mistake. That's the because, only way that makes sense. Because right. Why would someone do it? But if it was done by mistake that way, you don't, uh, you know, it doesn't... Uh, you don't become obligated later. I should mention also that after it becomes obligated in Truman Meiser, there is a mitzvah to do things in order. There's a mitzvah to do it in the proper order. And if you mess up the order, you're transgressing a sin. So the, uh, the, the, if you gave it early, then you not really, it doesn't seem like you, you transgress that sin because it was never obligated in being given. So therefore, it's not like you did it in the wrong order, maybe. But uh, the after the uh, you know after it became obligated in tithings, then you're definitely transgressing the sin of doing things in the wrong order, giving the the tithings in the wrong order, and the Torah tells us that we have to give it in the right order. Um, the next Gemara that we learned, uh, um, it mentioned that when you redeem Meiser Shani or Hegdis, you're supposed to add a fifth. And a fifth means, uh, it really means a fourth. We just have a different terminology, but the way the Gemara calls it a fifth, it's, uh, it ends up, it really, it turns out to be a fourth. But if you add that fourth to the uh, entire amount, you would, you know, that would be the, the, the fifth, that would be called a, a fifth, because if you have the full amount, all four plus this extra one, that's how much you have to give. Uh, but it, it's basically a fourth. So if you owed, a, so you had a hundred oranges and you wanted to bring them to Yushalayim to eat there, but it's a little heavy to carry. So you take a hundred dollar bill and you redeem it for those hundred. Now, really, that's not the amount. You really have to add a fifth, which is a fourth, which means $125. You should redeem it for $125 and bring that $125 to Yushalayim. The problem is this person didn't do that. Maybe he forgot. Or he didn't. He didn't separate yet the other tw- the other the, the fifth the extra the extra amount. So he just redeemed the 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 the, the initial um, principle, but he didn't add the extra. Now the halacha is you're not allowed to do that. Preferably, uh, you're not allowed to eat from it until you give the fifth. So let's say you went to Yushalayim and you spent that hundred dollar. Now let let's say you you you. you you redeemed it for the hundred dollar bill, and now you want to take an orange. So really, you know, and you didn't bring you the orange to Yushalayim. The orange is still here outside of Yushalayim. You live in a lot, and you're eating the orange. You live in uh, in Tzfas. so you're eating the. Uh, you want to eat the orange. The thing is, you're not allowed to really eat that orange until you give the extra twenty five, extra fifth. But if you did eat the orange, you can do a zim. So this is a case where it's prohibited initially to do that, to eat it. And um, um, we, nevertheless, you can do a zima. Why is it prohibited to eat it before you give the extra fifth? Because we're afraid you might end up forgetting to give the fifth. So therefore, the rabbis prohibited you from eating that, eating from it until you give the extra fifth. So... Uh, really, the preferable way to do this is you transfer the hundred or the case of oranges onto a hundred dollar, one hundred twenty five dollars, and then you could eat the oranges, and then you bring the one hundred twenty five dollars to you shalayim and enjoy it over there. So the oranges really should not be eaten until you really add the fifth. But if you did eat them, you can be mitzaref. You can join in a zimun because you didn't do a sin. By by or it's it's not a sin that's um, that causes uh, the food to be considered non kosher. It's uh, it, it, in other words, you can do a zimun on that food, even though preferably you should not have done that. 
So uh, that was the Gemara that we learned yesterday. And now we're going to continue with the next piece of Gemara. We're up to Hashamish Sha'achal Tezayis. So we're talking about a shamish that ate an olive size. Now you have to understand that the shamish is standing. He's serving the people. So he's not exactly sitting with them and in, in participating. But the Gemara says, the Mishnah has told us that he's allowed to join in the Zimun. So the Gemara says, Hashamish Achal Kazayas, if Hashamish ate a Kazayas, Shita, it's obvious that he's, why should, what, what, what makes him lose out? Why shouldn't he be counted? So the Gemara answers, no, because Mahu de Tema, I would have thought you might have said, Mahu de Tema literally means you. You would, you would think to say, Shamish like Kava, that he's not a Kvios. He's not uh, established together as a meal because he's standing and he's walking in and out. And uh, even though he did eat, but maybe you would say that his participation is not a solid participation. And uh, the Gemara answers, Kamash Malan, the Mishnah comes and lets us hear that he could even join in the Zimun. So this has to do with what's called a Kvios. In other words, initially, we had a Gemara way back about kvios, in order to do zimun, you really need to, to recline together. And then we said that nowadays we don't recline, so it's fine if you, you know, you're sitting together and so on. But here you have the shamish that's standing, is walking in and out. So this would be a thought, maybe he should not be able to be mitztaref to join. And the Gemara says that he is able to join. And the, the, the reason why why is he eligible to join? I mean, he is standing and uh, he's not really sitting with them, crowding around, you know, he's, he's standing and serving them. So either because this is the way he eats, this is his derech of eating, it is a kfiyas, this is, an, this is called an established meal for him. This is how he eats his established meal. Now, that, that's his meal. He's, he's a shamash, he's, that's what he's paid to do. He's got to eat that way. And... Um, and that would be the reason why he, uh, why he can join the others is because this is his established way of eating, um, which I guess means that the um, the shamish, uh, you know, he he's he's not just hired maybe for uh, for uh, an hour or two. It seems like he's you know he, he's got to eat during the meal. I mean, it sounds like he's probably stuck there for many hours. And therefore, we have to allow him to, uh, to sort of eat while he's serving them. So therefore, uh, he can even join, he can be mitzdarif. Either that or we're dealing with a shamish where they sort of have some relationship with him and therefore he's connected to them, maybe because he's, maybe he's scholarly and uh, he's participating. Somehow, it just seems interesting that, you know, you would think maybe they would tell him, eat before before you come, eat before you <laughs> eat before you arrive. You know, you, that 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 would be like a a, a thought. But uh, so I'm not sure of the practical. Um, I'm not sure of the practical uh, uh, side of how they, the shamish in the, in the olden days and the time of the Gemara, how he exactly uh, how long he worked for and how he was hired. But I'm just throwing some thoughts there that it does it does seem interesting that he is eating on the job. You know, nowadays you have the wait, the waiter, the waitress uh, eating on the job. Then you're not gonna, he's not gonna get a tip. You know, you, you see him popping in some uh, potato chips or something while he's uh, serving you. You know, or taking from some of your plate. You know, that doesn't. I don't know if uh, you would want to give him any. You know, give him any tips. I don't know if he would keep his job. But uh, anyway, to hear it talking about, I guess he had to eat his meal then. So that was part of his, his job was to eat the meal. Or, or maybe Shabbos, like on a Shabbos meal, you know, you sort of uh, expect the Shabbos maybe to, 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 to nibble a little. To, you know, he's got to eat his Shabbos meal, maybe something like that. In any event, he is able to join in the Zimun. Now, I will say there is one other explanation here that it, the first explanation I gave was because this is for him, this is his established meal. The other explanation is that because he's serving these other people, so he is considered like nullified or subservient to them. He's almost like 
a portion, he's like part of them. And therefore he joins in their meals. That's another way of looking at it. So there's the way of looking at it that for him, this is his established meal. But the other way of looking at it is that he somehow is part of their, part of them, part of their meal because he is there. He is so uh, subservient to them. Okay, and that's uh, that's basically this little piece of Gemara. Then comes the next Gemara about the Kuti, the Hakuti, Mizamnanol. Yes, Ben. I think it's also that they basically agreed before it's known that they're gonna he's gonna eat with them or part of, of what they are eating. So it's like we used to have a, a Gemara that talked about deciding that you're gonna eat together. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Or, or deciding that I'm going to eat there. We're going to eat over there. Right. Let's eat over gonna, there. Yeah, we're all going to eat there. You know, he eats his way and they eat their way, but they, they decided they're going to eat there. Right. I was just surprised that uh, he's allowed to eat on the job. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, the Gemara continues and it talks about the Kuti. So we're now, let's see where we are. We are uh, Kuti Mazamnano, Kuti. This is uh, six lines from the top of the page, 47b. The Hakuti Mazamnan, all of the Kuti, the uh, Kuti are these Gadrim that the king of Ashur brought to Israel and uh, put them in the land of Shomron. And they ended up becoming Gadrim. Why did they become Gadrim? So it's questionable. They either became Gairim because they were lions that were uh, devouring people and they felt, well, it must be because we're not becoming Jewish and we're in the land of Israel. We should, we may be obligated to become Jewish here. So they decided that they should become Gairim. But there is another opinion that says that they sincerely became Gairim. And uh, because of these the debate, it was always a big debate if the Kutim were acceptable as Jews or not, because if they converted for the wrong, because of the the Arayos, because of the lions, so then it's considered that their Gairos is not a real proper conversion. And, um, and because of that, uh, you know, and, and they didn't really accept the mitzvahs. And uh, ultimately, uh, the final conclusion was that they're not considered Jews, but our Mishnah is following the other view. In other words, that many for many generations or years, they 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 considered them possibly Jews. It was a debate if they're considered Jews or not. And so some Mishnahs in the, in the but Mishnah they're not is, allowed to marry with the Jews. Well, so, well, if they if they were. Gay Ray Emmes, then maybe they were allowed to marry with the right, but right, at that point. Right, as it is, they are not. Well, nowadays everyone agrees that they were gay Ray, that they that they're not kosher. And the reason why is because they found them worshiping the uh, some type of idol on the top of Har Grizim, a, a dove or something. So they they uh, they basically were caught. We caught them red-handed, and so they are not considered Jews, definitely, uh, definitely not considered um, um, Jews at this point. But at the time of the Gemara, and time of the Mishnah, I should say, there was still a debate if they were considered Jews or not. And our Mishnah follows that they are. And therefore, you could even do a Zimun with them. So the uh, Gemara says, Bakuti mezamnin olo. The Kuti, you could do a Zimun with him. So he ate together with you. You would be allowed to do a zimun. And um, and the Gemara asks Amai, why is that? We know that they are not careful in the mitzvahs. And there is a law that says you don't do a zimun with an am ha'ares, with someone who is not careful with mitzvahs. So am I, the Gemara asks, why is it that we could do a zimun with them? Let them not be except an am ha'ares. Let them, even if they would be uh, in the category of an am ha'ares, 
we wouldn't be able to do a zimun with them. And really, they're even worse because they're not careful to fulfill mitzvahs. So they're even worse than an Amaharetz. And even if they were an Amaharetz, we wouldn't do a zimun with them. An Amaharetz, we translated uh, before as someone ignorant, but we'll soon see that there's different translations of what Amaharetz is. But Vitanya, um, and we have a Brysa that says, you don't do a zimun with an Amaharetz. And And so how could uh, we tell you to be able that you could do a zimun with a kuti if you can't even do a zimun with an amaretz? Now, there is question over here that could an amaretz do a zimun with an amaretz? If you have three amaretz, could they do zimuns together? So if they could do zimuns together, so the, bride, so the Mishnah maybe is talking about a kuti with other Amaretz. They could do Zimons. He's doing Zimons with Amaretz. Right? So why? What's the Gemara's question? You know, Amaretz could do Zimons with other Amaretz. So maybe Akuti could do Zimons with, uh, with Amaretz. The Gemara is really asking that the Mishnah implies that even a Tamad Chacham could do a Zimon with the Kuti. Because the mission doesn't specify, we're talking about Amiyaris. So we're saying anyone, even Tamil Chachamim, can do Zimun with the Kuti. The Gemara is asking, why can a Tamil Chacham do Zimun, join together in a meal with the Kuti, if the Kuti is no worse, no better, excuse me, no better than an Amaretz? And an Amaretz, you can't, a Tamil Chacham doesn't do Zimun with a Amaretz. So the Gemara answers, Abaye gives two answers. First answer is Abaye. Abaye Omar, Abaye says, you know who we're talking about? Kuti Chav, Kuti Chaver. We're talking about he's a scholarly kuti. And this kuti, meaning he care, he's careful in mitzvahs. Now, just because many of them, or most of them maybe didn't do, weren't careful with their mitzvahs, but you did have individuals. And this kuti, again, we're talking about a time when the kuti, and there was a debate if they're kosher, if they're proper or not. And this one specific one was actually hanging out, uh, uh, studying and uh, learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. So this kuti was a kosher kuti. So the question is, could we accept? The Mishnah says, yes, you can do a zimun with him. Even though there's the, those that say kutim are not kosher Jews, the Mishnah paskins that they are kosher Jews. And you could do a zimun with them. And this is in the time before we came up with the conclusion that they're not kosher Jews. And this kuti happened to have been a decent kuti who followed mitzvahs, careful in mitzvahs, and therefore you could join him. And... Um, and a Tamad Chacham can do a Zimun with him. Now, the Gemara has a second answer. So that's the first answer. The first answer is, okay, so he's a Kuti, he's a Tamad Chacham. So, 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 so the question is, if he's careful in mitzvahs, what is the Mishnah telling us? Why is the Mishnah telling us you could do a, a zimun with a kuti? He's careful in all mitzvahs. Of course you could do a zimun with such a kuti, right? What would, what would you think? How would you think differently? What, what does the Mishnah have to tell you this for? He's a kuti. He, he, he's a kuti, but he does all the mitzvahs. So let him, let him join you in zimun. He doesn't sin. Yes, Ben? I don't know. Maybe we didn't talk about that, but maybe Amaharetz has more meanings than one. Ah, it could be we'll one, soon, we'll of, soon the lands, one right. of the lands people that are not Jewish even. Uh huh. Well, we'll also soon be deal. Amaharetz. Yeah, we'll soon deal with the Amaharetz thing, uh, okay. the, the next answer. But in the meantime, uh, I, so I sort of answered this question because I told you that there are different opinions about Kutim. Yeah. Now, let's maybe say the it ayin, it ayin, if, if you know it's a uh, kuti, you're thinking maybe uh, it's not following uh -huh. Okay, that's an interesting thought. But uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the simple understanding of the Gemara is that because there's two opinions about what kutim, if kutim are Jewish or not, because there's two opinions, so the Mishnah is teaching us that guess what? We consider them Jewish. That's what the mission is telling you. 
So why are you able to do a, 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 a Zimun with a Kuti? Why is that something unique that it's telling you you can do a Zimun with a Kuti? This Kuti keeps all the mitzvahs. Yeah, he keeps all the mitzvahs, but we don't know if he's Jewish. So the Mishnah is telling you that he is considered Jewish because there are, there are opinions that say all the Kutim are not Jewish. So it doesn't matter that he does all the mitzvahs. So he's careful in all the mitzvahs. Shkoyach, he's careful in all the mitzvahs, but, he, but he's not Jewish. You can't do a Zimun with him. The Zimun has to be with someone Jewish. So therefore the Mishnah is really, according to this opinion, by the way he's learning, we're dealing with a Kuti that's a, that's a scholar that's uh, keeping the mitzvahs. But uh, nevertheless, the Mishnah is telling you that and he is considered Jewish, you could do a Zimun with him. Because there could be a thought that you can't do a Zimun with him because according to the opinion that they're not Jewish, that they're Geros, their conversion was not a kosher conversion. So therefore, uh, it has to tell us. So that's, so that's they, the... They tell you to judge him to schut. No, that's, it's nothing to do with judge him to schut. It has to do with no. if, they, if they believe, they, you know, did they believe? Because again, the, the mitzvah of judging someone lizchus, uh, it applies not to if they're Jewish or not. That has to do with you know something that they did, you know, and if they're Jewish, you're supposed to be Dan Lakafschus. But to decide if they're Jewish, we don't judge someone the Kafschus to say we're gonna ju- we're gonna tell you you're Jewish because we're, but if he we're does you, the mitzvah, you have to know if they, we have to know if they accepted the mitzvah. In other words, a person could be. I'll give you an example. Some guy sit, decides that he's keeping all of the mitzvahs. So he jo- joins your shul, but he's a, he's a guy. He never did the conversion. He didn't dunk in the mitz- mikvah, and he didn't uh, do the circumcision, but he, he does everything. He's doing everything. In fact, he even did do the, the, the circumcision, but he didn't do the mikvah, right? So he does all the mitzvahs, even as circum- circumcised and everything. So now, do you accept him as Jewish? No way, he's a guy. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't have a, uh, an acceptance of the, of the official mitzvahs. It, it's just like in America, if someone acts like an American, and they even have an American flag on their house, and they but they have a foreign passport. They don't. They're not. They weren't born here. They're not. They didn't. Uh, they're not American. And you can scream all you love how how you love America all day long. You're not American. So the same thing is Jewish. You're not Jewish unless you actually are accepted officially as being Jewish. And that has to go through the mikvah, the tefillah, the, 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 and accepting the mitzvahs properly, and so on. And if someone doesn't do that, so that's why the conservative don't accept reform conversions. And the orthodox don't accept re- conservative reconversions and so on and so forth. Because each one realizes that the other one is not a real acceptance of the mitzvahs. And uh, therefore... The, uh, there is, of course, a, of course, it's a very big insult if someone con- converts and they're, and they're uh, you know, you, some people don't consider them Jewish, but you can't blame them. It's not, they're not being, they're not uh, trying to, uh, to uh, promote their views. It's the, it's the fact that according to the law, it, this is a question of Jewish law. Are you considered Jewish? Even if you accept, even if you do everything perfectly and you're more careful than the very religious, doesn't make you American. You know, you could be more, you be so careful what you, doesn't, it's not going to make you American, it's not going to make you Jewish if you do everything so perfectly. You have to be officially accepted as a Jew by fulfilling the process that needs to be done in order to become a Jew according to the laws of the Torah of what a conversion is. And that is, uh, of course, it's a very sticky subject and it's very hard to uh, tell someone that they're not really Jewish when they think they're Jewish and they act very Jewish. But if they wanted to be smart, and a lot of people do this, is they actually go for a a, a proper conversion. So they convert once and it's not accepted. They convert another time. Sometimes even that's not. Then they finally convert again and they finally get everyone accepts them as being Jewish. Yes, uh, Robert. And, you know, I've I've struggled with this. You know, my family's been Jewish forever. Uh Yet I don't have any papers that say that I'm Jewish. What do you do with something like that? Well, how are you? Who's supposed to give you those papers? No one has. Papers. What I'm saying, there isn't any authority other than right. it's my lineage that right. I proved that you know I had my bar mitzvah, I had my bris, I had my bar mitzvah. You know, I'm from derived from both a Jewish father and mother. For all I know, through you know through the generations before me, but it's my word, I guess. So right. that's part of the dilemma, right? Or is it not well, a dilemma? 
well, that's not, no, that's not really what we're dealing with here. I here we're dealing that. with stuff with people who we know are converts. Okay. And we're not sure what, how to, how to label them because their conversion was questioned. Right. No, I understand. And this that. is, this is really, uh, but uh, the fact that you're, you, you know, you're, you have a uh, tradition. Lineage. And uh, yeah. well, first of all, your, your last name is it gives it away. Jewish. <laughs> it gives it a, you know, so it's, it's automatic, <laughs> Robert, you're, you're in. <laughs> Thanks. The real McCoy. Quote I don't know court, about right? me. <laughs> Smith, but I have you, my questions, right? Yeah, you're all set. You're, you're all set. What right. more can you ask for a rabbi? <laughs> exactly. <in> the <laughs> well, the funny thing is, there's a, there, there are some, uh, like in reform shuls, that there are some rabbis that others will say they're not even Jewish. Right. You know, right. No, it, is, it is that. funny, sure. but, the, you know, you find that. It's we had a, rabbi, we yeah. had a rabbi here at the uh, uh, Miami Jewish home who was like the official rabbi over there. And it turns out his conversion was a very questionable conversion. And therefore, he's probably not Jewish, but he was the rabbi. there, You know, right. he, was, right. he was the rabbi, but he wasn't he wasn't Jewish. He's not a Jewish rabbi. But uh, <laughs> anyway, bottom line is, so it's not so simple. But uh, but generally, um, a convert, you you know, you have to you do find out you do need other people to testify for someone, okay. you know, sure. and where they're, they're, you know, you don't know where they're from. So you find someone who knows them um, and and. Uh, and uh, this way, um, uh, you 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 know you know their you know their lineage, and and uh, and then if someone is a convert, they generally will have a paper who they convert. And generally, they're proud of it because they think that their conversion paper is you know is is a proof. And then little do they realize that their conversion paper is like uh, uh, they got it from some guy who you just do a sixty minute uh, process and you get your your paper. And uh, people know about it. You know, we know we have names of who, you know, which rabbis are acceptable and which aren't. Yes, uh, Mordechai. Yeah, he's muted. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, our you know our two sons uh, they're adopted from San Antonio, Texas, and uh, we had them uh, converted. Uh, it was a based in headed by uh, Aaron Raskin in downtown Brooklyn. And so now they have uh, the yeah, paper from him, uh, I mean, showing uh, that they were uh, converted by somebody liable. And so uh, now uh, they can go around uh, with the uh, proof uh, that they're Jewish. Right, right, right. And especially in Eretz Yisrael, it becomes very complicated because Israel has a very strict rules um, hopefully they'll they'll keep them uh, the very strict rules on, on on conversion, and so they will not do a marriage if there's any question about uh, uh, you know about Le the conversion. Lineage. Yeah, so 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 uh, so it becomes big, uh, you know, very uh, one of the ways you explain to a congregant that the conversion is not good. Sometimes is you tell them, well, you know, in Israel they will not marry you. A Jew, and that is sometimes a, a major factor that like wakes them up, and they realize, you know, that conversion in Israel is not accepted, and uh, this way they sort of like catch on, you know, maybe uh, maybe uh, we should redo our conversion, reevaluate if we're really Jewish. Um, the uh, so the Gemara continues, so it, it deals with this kuti, and the question was, uh, why is he able to? join in a zimun, we know many of the kutim were not careful on the mitzvahs. And uh, the Gemara here says that Rava Amar, so Rava, now comes the next answer of the Gemara. The first answer was, well, this kuti is, is someone who's very careful on the mitzvahs. And the reason why we're accepting him is because his, this opinion holds that the, 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 the kuti conversion was a good conversion. Now, the Rava says that even if you say we're dealing with a kuti amharetz. Even if you say that we're afilu tema, even if you will uh, say that the kuti that we're talking about in the Mishnah that you can do a zimun with is amharetz, he's a someone who's not so knowledgeable. Nevertheless, the here, amharetz, 
Durabonon de Pligi Ale Durabmeir Askinon. We're dealing with what's called an Amharetz, who is um, uh, an Amharetz that the rabbis uh, argued with Reb Meir about. So there is a Brisa, the Sefta, that talks about an argument between uh, Reb Meir and the rabbis. And our Mishnah follows the rabbi's view there. The Tanya, because we learned in a Brisa, a Zehu Amaretz, who is considered an Amaretz. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't tell us regarding what laws. There's all different types of laws that we could be talking about. An Amaretz for this type of law, an Amaretz for that law. There's laws of Tumah, purity and impurity. There's laws of Amaretz for Zimun, who can be, you could be a, do a Zimun with an Amaretz. Uh, there are um, uh, areas of, of Halacha that, with Miser, could you trust them with regard to tithings or not? So there's different areas of halacha that we deal with the situation of an Am Ha'aretz, someone who's not so careful in the laws. Literally, the Am Ha'aretz means ignorant, but, uh, or I shouldn't say that, literally means Am Ha'aretz means the nation of the land, I mean like a, a, a simple person of the, of the land. That's literally what it means. And generally, that refers to someone who's ignorant. But uh, when it comes to the specific technical laws of the mitzvahs. So we have different situations where we'll call this person Am Amharet regarding the laws of Miser. Um, and we'll say, we're not sure if we can trust him that he took the tithings or regarding the laws of Tumah and Tahara. We don't know if we could trust him regarding the laws of purity and impurity or regarding the laws of Zimon. We don't know if we could accept him as being part of the Zimon. So anyway, there's different rules of Amharetz. So here, the Brisa just says a very blanket rule. It, it says, what is an Amharetz? So, uh, uh, someone who doesn't eat his regular produce with measures of holiness, which means that he doesn't go to the mikvah and make sure that he's pure when he um, to eating his, his uh, chulav. And uh, what that means is that According to halacha, according to Jewish law, you're allowed to eat food when you're impure. You can eat, you can touch food that's uh, make it impure and so on, no problem. But there were special people that never wanted to uh, touch, they didn't want to make food impure by, uh, by, uh, by um, not being extra careful. Therefore, they would always go to the mikvah when they, when they needed to, before they would touch any food. And we know this story from the Chumash, because if you remember the story of Sarah, Abraham, Avraham asked Sarah to go make some bread, some loaves. Go make for them some cakes, some matzah. And, uh, and we don't find that she did. She didn't end up giving them matzah that he wanted her to give. Why not? So Rashi tells us because she became a nida. She became a nida. Now, just because she started menstruating doesn't mean she can't bake food. According to halacha, you're allowed to eat. You're, you know, a woman is impure. She could still uh, bake bread and, and so on. But the thing is, Avraham was extra careful to eat. The, the not, if, they, if they were impure, they wouldn't touch any food and make the food impure. And therefore, they would eat their chulen betahara. They would make sure to eat food when they were uh, in a way of purity. They were careful not to ruin any of their food that make it to make it impure. And that, that they, and therefore, um, uh, that's why Sarah did not end up uh, baking the matzahs. But the uh, so Reb Meir here, the word these are the words of Reb Meir. Our Brisa tells us that anyone that's not careful, even though it's permissible to eat food that's impure. And you don't have to be careful not to make food impure. You could, no problem, make it impure, no problem. But if you're not, if you don't do that, you are considered an Amharis. That's what Remeyer held. Remeyer held that a person who's not careful with their regular food to be, to eat it in purity, they are considered an Amharis. The Chachamimimim, the rabbis say, Kol ma'asir of karo. Person who's not careful to take miser 
from their produce properly, that's called an Amhara, someone who uh, is not so careful. Now, uh, let's just say we're dealing with the laws of Zimun. So if the laws of Zimun, the mayor would hold that you're not allowed to do a Zimun with people who don't have this extra level of purity. And, um, and uh, the Chachamim say, no, as long as people eat their food that's tithed properly, as long as people are careful to tithe their food properly, then it's not a problem to do a zimun with them. But if they don't, they're not careful to do their, to uh, tithe their food properly, then you cannot do a zimun with them. And, um, and so this opinion of the rabbis is what Rava says, that here we're dealing with a kuti, an amharet, and the, 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 the uh, nevertheless, you're allowed to do a zimun with this kuti who's an amharet, vahani kutoy, and these kutim, the Gemara continues, asuri masri to the chazim. They do take Meiser properly, Kiddachazi properly. And what it says in the Torah, they're actually very careful about. They follow things that it says explicitly in the Torah. And therefore, they are careful about it. And therefore, you could do a Zimun with Kutim because they are careful to do uh, their tithings. They do their tithings properly. So, there are people who don't do their tithings properly, but the kutim do. They are careful in the Bible, things that are clear in the Torah, they care. Kol mitzvah shechziku ba kutim. Any mitzvah that the kutim chose to, 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 to do, har medaktikim ba, they're very careful in it. Yoiser mi Yisrael, even more than the regular Jews. So that's an interesting thing, that sometimes you have people who are uh, newcomers and they actually get more involved, more careful than the regular and regular Jewish people. So here, the reason why Rava says it's a, you're allowed to do it with a kutim is be, you're allowed to uh, eat together and a, zoom, uh, a zimun together. Uh, you could do a zimun together with the kuti is because they are uh, careful in their in their uh, tithings. And the rabbis hold that the people you can't do a, a zimun with is ones who are not careful in their tithings, but the kutim are careful, and therefore you could do a zimun with them. So that's the, uh, that's the way Rava explains the Mishnah. So we've got the uh, Baye's explanation that we're dealing with a Kuti who is a scholar, so to speak. He's a very, he's a proper scholar. And the Mishnah is telling you that you can, that you can consider Kutim Jewish. According to Rava's shot, the Mishnah is telling us an interesting law that the Kutim, even though they aren't careful in many of the laws, but they are careful in tithings, or at least this one, these are the one, the one you're dealing with that the Mishnah is talking about, are very careful in the tithings, and therefore um, you, uh, you can include them in your zimun. Taisvis over here mentions oh, he actually mentions it on the next little piece of Gemara. But the point that he mentions is that nowadays we do zimun with everyone. Imagine you have some people in your house, and then you say, "Oh, I can't do a zimun because you're not a you're a you're a amaretz. You, you can't do that. You, you're uh, you, you're going to be pushing Jewish people away." So even if that would be true, that uh, there are uh, that there's someone who's an amaretz, you would. Uh, Taisa says nowadays we don't exclude any amaretz from zimun. Everyone is included. And um, one of the reasons is because we, don't, we aren't scholars anymore. So we're all considered like in the category of Amharats. But the Taisus' reason is that if we would exclude them, the, if we would, the Taisus doesn't say that. Taisus says that the reason is because if we would exclude the Amharats, uh, they're going to end up going and building their own altar and they're going to separate from the community and make their own do their own thing. And it is, um, it, it, therefore, the rule that we should exclude them from doing Zimun doesn't apply because it will lead to worse. 
in other words, it will have much a, a worse effect than what the rabbis wanted it to have. In other words, the reason why the rabbis wanted to exclude them was to get them to be more careful, let's say, in, in, in certain mitzvahs. But we, by us uh, excluding them, it would, uh, it would actually make it worse. They would be less careful in mitzvahs. And therefore, the, um, the, 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 uh, the tradition, so to speak, changed uh, in its, the way it was applied. In other words, the goal is to help encourage them to do more mitzvahs. So the way to apply that is to include them instead of to exclude them. And uh, that's what Taisus mentions here. And that's the uh, broad in Shulchan Aruch as well. In the Shulchan Aruch in chapter um, 199, chapter 199, the Shulchan Aruch mentions that um, an Am Haaretz Gomor, a real Am Haaretz, Mizamnin Allah Bizman Hazeh, we do a Zimun with him nowadays. And the, the Mishaburah brings down that in the Gemara, it says that even if he's knowledgeable, but he didn't, uh, he, he didn't um, study, even if he's knowledgeable in Mishnah, but he didn't study the, the reasons behind it, you're not allowed to do a zeman with such a person, which we'll soon see in the next little piece of Gemara. But nevertheless, therefore it says in Namba um, um therefore you would think that you can't do a zimun with an Am Haaretz. Therefore, the, the Shulchan Aruch says that even an Am Haaretz, a real Am Haaretz, that doesn't have any of these this knowledge, uh, the, that uh, you you do a zimun together with him. Because if you separate, if we, you would separate from him, they will separate from the community completely. And, um, and therefore, we have to include them in the zimun. Then he goes on to other complicated situations. What happens if he's if he is not just an Amaretz, but he doesn't fulfill biblical mitzvahs publicly? Like, for example, he doesn't say Shema in the morning or in the evening. You know, so here you have, uh, I think, a more practical example is if someone goes to work on Shabbos, someone drives on Shabbos, someone publicly transgresses the Shabbos. So, the, you know, that would probably be a, another example where you have to deal with, can you do a zeman with someone who's publicly um, transgressing uh, the, you know, certain sins? Can you do a zeman together? So in Am Haaretz, uh, the, the reason why we include them is, what do you want from them? They don't know so much. They're not so knowledgeable. So, you know, if we separate them, they're going to even become more separated. Fine, you got to include them. But someone who separated himself in the first place you know, someone who transgresses the laws publicly and is not embarrassed of, it's not like by mistake or once in a while or in a time of great need or something like that, but he's publicly doing it. This would be questionable about doing, a, it's interesting, it is questionable about doing a Zeman about, on such a person. The Alter Rebbe also brings in chapter 199, he says, however, a person who doesn't say Shema in the morning and in the evening, you can't do a Zeman with him because since the majority of the Amayarets, they say Shema, so, um, you know, by separating oneself um, from such people, it's not like they're separate. It's not like they're starting their own religion because most of them do say Shema. And then he goes on to say about someone who does uh, sins publicly, that uh, uh, someone like that who does sins in public, that he's not greater than, uh, than an Am Haaretz in the time of the Gemara. So... The Alter Rebbe also seems to, uh, you know, emphasize this issue. So the point is that nowadays we don't really have people who publicly, uh, you know, sin. Uh, even people who drive to Shul on Shabbos, they think that they're doing something right. You know, they're not really, uh, they, they, they're, they're, you know, they think that it's okay or they think that what they're doing is, they're not publicly doing it as a disgrace for mitzvahs. That's what it seems that they should be able, everyone should be able, all Yidin should be able to be included. The people who would not be included would seemingly be people who are um, fighting Yiddishkeit and saying that Yiddishkeit is wrong and so on and so forth. Maybe such a person would be questionable to, uh, to include in a minion. But uh, in other words, someone who's knowledgeable, like a professor, and he, he uh, is against... Uh, you know, the laws of Yiddishkeit, you know, if you had someone like that who's knowledgeable and fighting it, uh, 
you know, publicly de desecrating the, uh, the, uh, the laws of the Torah. But uh, generally nowadays you have, you, you, you know, people can be included in a minion. But the, the Argomar is dealing with the Amharats. Amharats generally means someone who's not so, not so careful, maybe not so knowledgeable. But now the Gemara comes to the next, the next price that tells us a little more detail of what an Amharat, different opinions of what an Amharat is. So the next Gemara says, Tano Rabbanan, the rabbis learned. Ezeu Amharat, who's an Amharat? And again, the Gemara, the, the, the Gemara doesn't really tell us what, regarding what laws. So it's a little vague. We're talking about the laws of trusting them for their food, that their food is kosher, it's tithe. Are we talking about Zimon? Are we talking about Tum and Tahara? We can trust that their house is pure, that it's not impure. But anyway, it just mentions it vaguely. What is an Amharetz? And it says, the first opinion, Kol she'ena kairi kriyashma arvis b'shachos. Whoever doesn't say Shema in the evening and in the morning, um, they are called an Amharetz. Divir Rebbe Eliezer. These are the words of Rebbe Eliezer. What that means is that there's a biblical obligation to say Shema. Even a person doesn't do the whole davening, but at least they should say the Shema and the, Shema, the appropriate time to say Shema is within the first three hours of the day. We've learned that earlier in the chapter. And also we learned at night there's a mitzvah to say Shema. Preferably it should be before midnight. So at night, after it's dark, after three, so we, we've learned these laws. So a person who doesn't do that, I mean, that's a very easy mitzvah to fulfill. A person who doesn't do that, according to this, Bryce is considered an Amhara. It's possibly questionable if they could do a Zima. Now, uh, the, the, in Shulchan Aruch, it, it deals with... Uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, someone who doesn't do that is, is for sure you can't do a zeman with, but it would seem that they're dealing with someone who's not aware of the fact that it's a biblical obligation and it's important to say the Shema twice a day, at least biblically. Now, rabbinically, we say Shema also uh, in, in our, uh, at night before we go to sleep, and uh, we say Shema uh, in the early, before the prayers in the morning, but uh, biblically, you have to say Shema twice a day, so the, the um, uh, person who doesn't is, uh, according to the, uh, the, this, this opinion, Divrei Rebbe Eliezer, Rebbe Eliezer holds he's considered an Am Ha'aretz, and possibly can't join a Zimun. Now, um, what I was going to say is that probably a lot of people who don't do it nowadays are just simply ignorant. They're not aware that it's an obligation. There should be room to be lenient for such people to join your Zimun. Rabbi Yeshua, I mean, Rabbi Yeshua says, tfilin. if you don't put tefillin on, that would be considered an Amhar. That would be a question. Now, again, there's also a lot of people who don't understand the obligation of doing tefillin, and they're not aware of the importance and its value and it's, that it's a daily obligation. It's not just a nice thing to do. But the point is that uh, it's definitely, it's one of those things that's considered, a person is considered an Amhar, that's according to this opinion, Rabbi Yeshua. He doesn't do tefillin. And as I am, like tzitzis person who doesn't put tzitzis on his four-cornered garment is considered a uh, amharat. If he doesn't have a mezuzah on his doorway. And a person who has children and sons and he doesn't teach them to the Torah, he doesn't uh, bring them up to the Torah, which I guess would mean if someone doesn't send his kids to a Jewish school. You know, it's part of the uh, you know, if you, if you want your kids, if you want to bring them up to Torah, you got to bring them, you got to expect, you, you can't expect more than, uh, than uh, uh, you know, what you, you more you put it, th than you put into it. Don't expect to get out of it more than what you put into it. So if you don't send them to a Jewish school, what can you, uh, what can you expect from, uh, from children? So here it says if a person doesn't send his kids, doesn't bring them up to studying Torah, they are, the, the father is considered an Amharetz. Others say, and often Acherim refers to Reb Meir, but uh, here it's a little unclear if it could refer to Reb Meir because we find somewhere else where Reb Meir said something, a different opinion. So we're just going to translate it as others say. Others say, This is very interesting. If a person who studied Chumash and Rishana and learned Mishnayis, literally it means he didn't serve scholars, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that. The commentaries over here explain it means he didn't get involved in the debates and the discussions of the scholars that explain the laws of the Mishnah. So that means you might know the Shulchan Aruch very well, but you don't know the reasons behind the Shulchan Aruch. So even such a person, if he doesn't know the reasons behind the laws, Hareza Amoretz, that is an Amoretz, Amar Rafuna, Halacha Kachedrim, and Rafuna says, you know what? That's the Halacha. That if you don't 
know the reasons behind the laws, you're considered an Amharic. So you can know a lot of laws. There are people, they know the Shulchan Aruch very well, but they don't know how to apply it to different scenarios. That is comes from knowing the reasons. And how, does, how do you get to know the reasons? You got to sit in on the debates and discussions when the rabbis discuss the Mishnah. By just reading the Mishnah, you get the, the laws, but you don't get the reasons behind it. So you'll get the law in this case, but you won't know how to apply it to another case. So that's called below Shimesh Tamidi Chachom. He didn't serve the scholars, I mean, he didn't involve himself with the with studying the reasons that the scholars explain and how they the the the, uh, the discussions that they have. So that is considered an Amharat and the halacha is like a cheram, which would imply like even a person who's knowledgeable, but they don't know the reasons behind things, you can't include them in a zimun. And on this, Taisu says, no, 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 no. And nowadays, we're not mocked on all these things. It's all fine. You don't want to separate them. And uh, even if the Allah is kachirim, but uh, we include all these people in a zimun. And, um, and he brings a source. He says in the Gemara Chagiga, it says, we even take testimony from Anam Haaretz because we follow Rabbi Yaisi that no one should go and build their own bama, their own altar for themselves. So the halacha follows that final conclusion which is uh, mentioned over there in the Gemara Chagiga that, uh, that we don't want the Ame Haaretz to um, end up separating themselves more from the community. Okay, Mordechai. Yeah, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, there's a parallel Bryce somewhere else where they discuss of uh, what, what is a Chilwa Hashem and they uh, go through like uh, similar things and I uh, want one of the Rabbanim said, uh, if I don't go around filling all day, that would be a fill of us. Uh-huh. Better go on with, with filling, did you say? Right, right. All, all day? Uh-huh. All day. Uh-huh. 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 Interesting. So that's like within the within the levels of, here we're just saying at least put on filling. Doesn't you know we're not dealing with all day, but you're dealing with you're dealing with the, the mitzvah of Khilul Hashem. So right, if the scholar there is a concept that if the scholar doesn't do his extreme, you know, his his extreme levels, then the weaker per it's it's like a domino effect. So if if I don't learn 10 hours a day, so what's it gonna end up happening is the other guy is gonna not even learn an hour a day, and then the other guy is not even gonna learn for a minute a day because there's a whole domino effect, like so. Anyway, it's an interesting uh, uh, understanding of, uh, but that's uh, that's Shkaya. Thank you for bringing.